Again, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to this IGDS final graduate seminar by Tivia Collins, May 18th. We welcome our assessors, Dr. Barrett and Dr. Gomes. We acknowledge Dr. Levi Gaiman, supervisor, and our head of department, Dr. Gabriel Hossein. Tivia, take us away. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much, all 29 of you. Um, for logging on. I really do appreciate it. And I especially look forward to the valuable feedback that I'll receive today, um, especially, of course, from the assessors. So I will begin. They don't like us, and we know it. Immigration is stress, but we have to survive and make Trinidad work for us. My house in Guyana almost finished building, and I made a lot of friends here. Trini friends, I mean. I even convinced some to visit home, change their opinion, I hope, because that is my job. The system might be hard, but me and plenty other Guyanese women making it. So I guess that is the migration story. Well, my story. Many other Guyanese women's story, too. This quote from a Guyanese migrant woman highlights the complex relationships migrant women negotiate on a daily basis and it sets the tone for my presentation, as today I will be presenting an overview of some of the key findings of my research. This PhD research is a political project that examines the lived experiences of Guyanese migrant women in Trinidad and Tobago. I illustrate how notions of belonging, citizenship, and borders are materially lived by those who engage in intra-regional migration within the Anglophone Caribbean and I assert that recognizing this movement might foster greater regional consciousness. This seminar will be structured as follows. I will provide a brief overlook at my research. Then I will explore how the politics of belonging unfolds as Guyanese women's migratory experiences to Trinidad and Tobago. This is done through a discussion of two of the four thematic areas from the research, notions of belonging and contestations with citizenship. To demonstrate this, I provide descriptive summaries of the data sets and I base my analysis theoretically in Yuval Davis's theorization of the politics of belonging and Eudine Barato's theorization of Caribbean gender systems. And I conclude today by exploring the next steps necessary towards completion. Now, this is a qualitative study that is guided by one central research question and four sub-questions. The central research question is, how do Guyanese women explain their lived experiences as migrants within Trinidad and Tobago? The sub-questions are, how do Guyanese migrant women experience belonging in Trinidad and Tobago? How do these women navigate the politics of citizenship as they confront the ideological and material dimensions of Caribbean gender systems? How do these women in Trinidad and Tobago negotiate borders that operate as exclusionary systems of oppression? And how do Guyanese women's practices of transnational living impact their connections to home? To respond to these research questions, I draw from Patricia Hill Collins and Dorothy Smith as I use feminist standpoint theory as the methodological framework. Feminist standpoint grounds research in the realities of women's lived experiences and attempts to understand the multiple experiences of the human condition. So through this approach, I center Guyanese migrant women and evaluate their distinct standpoint of intra-regional migration. Now, in terms of the data collection, I spent about two years traveling across Trinidad and Tobago, conducting in-depth interviews and facilitating focus group discussions with 68 Guyanese migrant women. And this slide shows the methods of data collection and importantly, the ethnicities of all of the participants and of course, um, the numbers. And this slide shows the, the categorizations that I developed based on the jobs that they occupied and their immigrant status. Now, during the interviews, a lot of these women shared about how they make adjustments here, their navigation of bureaucracy, and about positive and negative experiences while living in Trinidad and Tobago. I then transcribed and sorted the interviews 
and used concept-driven and thematic coding to categorize the data. At the methods of analysis stage, I analyzed their talk, nonverbal reactions, and interactions among themselves through narrative analysis and critical discourse analysis to generate responses to the research questions. So based on this method of analysis, I will now move on to the preliminary findings and emerging themes. I found that as Guyanese women migrated, they experienced increased personal relations, different forms of navigations with the state and state agents, unique family arrangements, and greater cultural and social connections in the midst of attaining work towards economic security, which of course was their primary reason for migrating. These occurrences produced complex relations in their everyday lives as they made assessments of themselves and others, what I found based upon a set of political and ethical value systems. Now these value systems are defined as the politics of belonging. And this is the framework, the politics of belonging, is what I use to examine Guyanese women's experiences here because trends in their everyday lives suggest that they are actively engaged in navigations of the boundaries of exclusion and inclusion. Therefore, this research is an interrogation of how the politics of belonging unfolds in Guyanese women's migratory experiences. I account for how power relations around boundary settings are navigated, which impacts how migrants feel legitimized and are othered within Trinidad and Tobago. I also assert that Guyanese migrant women's everyday becomes an elaboration of how structural and interpersonal dynamics situate them within three major aspects of the politics of belonging. And these are, questions about how social locations and identities mediate their belongingness, notions of citizenship and constructions of borders, and emotions associated with their imagined and rooted affiliations of home or to home. Now this situating infers that beyond the language of labor and the economic structures that mediate how these women live, Guyanese migrant women's everyday movement places the politics of belonging as a central category of analysis. Now I use these three aspects of the politics of belonging, which of course were developed by Yuval Davis, so it came straight from my literature review. I use these to be the basis for the themes of my research, and I, I use these to divide my three data analysis chapters. However, for today, I will be looking at one and a half of these. So I'll be looking at narratives of belonging and notions of citizenship on their belongingness. Guyanese migrant women expressed different senses of belonging and different degrees of both positive and negative experiences in Trinidad and Tobago with Trinbagonians, other Guyanese migrants, and nationals from other countries. Now, this was foremost dependent upon their migrant status, their occupation, and their race. So starting with their interpersonal relationships with Trinbagonians, most of the women who migrated through a CSME certificate, regardless of their race, relayed that their greatest challenges were stigma and discrimination occurring on the job. This slide has a few excerpts from four, Guy four different Guyanese women. Now, I note that there may not be enough time for you to read it, but I just wanted you to get a sense of what the data look like. So you could do an overview and of course, listen to me. <laughs> So I found that 21 of the 25 women that I interviewed with CSME certification found themselves at the center of unsolicited, sexist, and xenophobic jokes and comments, which produced anti-Guyanese sentiments while at work. Notably, the four women who did not experience these occupied high-ranking positions of power within their organization. But these Guyanese women also shared that though most times they feel secure enough because of their migrant status to respond, the comments make them feel out of place, invoking strong feelings of unbelonging. Similarly, during the focus group discussion, all 11 of the migrant students um, I interviewed across different ethnic divides related that among other experiences, 
the teasing that they received because of their Guyanese accent made them feel like if they don't belong. And these were the words that they used. Now, as this slide indicates, the students discussed how comments about their distinct Guyanese accent were generalized and used to make them feel excluded since it placed them in a category as they, they called it, other types of Guyanese. Now, Walter 2017 notes that accents construct people as outsiders and are used to label groups as different, even though variations of accents from the same group can be a social marker. I found that this in particular further complicated the belonging experiences of these students because although the distinction of the accents mattered to them, it appeared to be less influential in distinguishing themselves from what they call other types of Guyanese migrants. So now I will examine some narratives from these other types of migrant women. Those who did not have a CSME certificate shared that they felt like the bottom of the barrel as Guyanese in Trinidad and Tobago. As an illustration, I spoke to domestic workers about how they feel they are perceived as well as how these perceptions affect them. All nine of the domestic workers interviewed expressed negative stereotypes about their womanhood, oh sorry, they experienced negative stereotypes about their womanhood that they classified as terrifying and at times violent. But these stereotypes for them particularly was heavily based on race. In addition to these experiences on the slide, Many of the working class Indo-Guyanese women who did domestic work shared that they speak less in public spaces because many of them are targeted by Trinbagonian men who attempt to sexually harass and assault them. Many were also warned by other Indo-Guyanese that they would be discriminated against because of how they speak. And one domestic worker shared with me that she had to learn the Trini accent quickly in order to survive. And this is the word that she used. Now, this was not an experience shared by Afro-Guyanese domestic workers who did not think that their challenges were raced, but solely based upon their gender and their nationality. I note that only three of the women who held work permits, which was in the domestic, domestic workers category, only three of them felt as if they could have challenged these narratives. And these were the three who held renewable work permits. However, they said that they would have never challenged it because they were afraid to lose their job. It was therefore not surprising while in the field that when I asked about positive perceptions and interactions, those who migrated through CSME and those who are migrant students related many positive encounters and experiences with Trinbagonian people compared to those who did not migrate through these processes. And these positive encounters they noted make their lives feel safe in Trinidad and Tobago to an extent and it's more manageable and comfortable a sentiment not shared by other types of women interviewed. Now to conclude on this thematic area, I want to highlight the ways Guyanese migrant women acquired political agency and formed communities of care in order to receive support and experience belonging within Trinidad and Tobago. But these communities I found are based upon similarities of class, belief systems, and race which I interpret to mean that these classifications create a greater sense of belonging in a space and presence that they feel reads them as other. So formally, and this is on the left side of the, uh, the slide, formally organizations such as the Guyana Agency for Development Affairs, comprising mainly of working class Afro-Guyanese women and the Guyana Student Association of Trinidad and Tobago, of course, comprising of students, became spaces for them to meet up and build community. Participants interviewed from these groups spoke of feeling safe, feeling like home, and not feeling alone as the major benefits of the organizations. Informally, so this is on the right side, informally there are multiple communities of care forming and growing, including friendships among Guyanese from similar class and race backgrounds. And I found this to be a major one. So I note here, that those with CSME certification tended to be a part of Guyanese circles based on class, while many working class Guyanese women express that in terms of friendships and race, they made a conscious decision to stick to quote unquote, we own. Now historically and contemporary, Guyana has troubled race relations among mainly Afro and Indo-Guyanese, 
So it is not surprising that this is manifested within their migration to Trinidad and Tobago. Analysis of these race relations, of course, will be thoroughly explored in the larger thesis. It's continuing. Many women also develop bonds of friendship with other non-Trinbagonian nationals and similarities of religion created new friendships as well in places of worship. And finally, similarities of class brought together people who obtained CSME certifications and many students closer to Trinbagonian men and women who provided them with support and who demonstrated the principle of mutual dignity. And of course, I must say that personally, I have experienced this kind of kindness from many Trinbagonians, and I'm sure many of you are on this call. So moving on to the second thematic area, which is citizenship. Today, I will focus on what the relationship between Guyanese migrant women and the state in Trinidad and Tobago looks like as they attempt to access necessary material resources. Now, this is significant because migrant women's ability to access these resources are hardly ever up to them. The state determines through transnational and bilateral agreements, as well as through national laws and policies, and of course, it's enforcing bureaucratic arm, the types of migrants that are accepted, the degrees and the degrees to which they are allowed to access citizenship. Now, Barito notes that Caribbean women experience different degrees of unequal power relations with the state, often based upon race and socioeconomic class. My research suggests very similar findings. I found that women who occupied a lower socioeconomic status experienced many overt forms of discrimination meted out against them by the state which directly impacted their access to material resources. Now, this slide provides two excerpts, one from a market vendor and the other from a housewife. And it highlights the anti-Guyanese sentiments through state agents who constantly threaten these women. And this slide is a bit heavy, right? So, but it shows that even though Guyanese women are able to access, you know, degrees of material resources, and they've all shared this, for example, they can send money back to Guyana. They can take care of their families. Um, they have a greater level of financial freedom that was not attainable to them before they migrated. However, their complex and at times violent interactions with the state reflect the unjust Caribbean gender relations that disempower migrant women. I therefore suggest that the bureaucratic arm of the state limits women's access to material resources by reinforcing ideological gender relations through constructions of femininity that are based upon cultural and social gendered stereotypes of Guyanese women within Trinidad and Tobago. The state's reinforcement of these stereotypes creates unequal power relations between migrant women and the state, which impacts the level of security they feel while attempting to gain these economic resources. And of course, these occurrences are not limited to women from a specific socioeconomic background. As Barito notes, despite the assumptions about socioeconomic class differences, all women have limited access to degrees of power, status, and resources. So I found that women who have a CSME certificate also experience various forms of discrimination, such as receiving inappropriate comments from government agents about how their access to jobs takes away opportunities from Trinbagonians. And also some were constantly told that they would be better off married than working so hard in Trinidad. Though the encounters may not provide the same degrees of insecurities when compared to women from other socioeconomic classes because of course of the security of the CSME certificate, their experiences also indicate that regardless of your migrant status, your race, or your class, the bureaucratic arm of the state makes conscious attempts to limit access to citizenship for migrant women, directly impacting their abilities to achieve economic security. Because citizenship is not only about your ability to live or study or work within Trinidad and Tobago, but it encompasses an environment that is without fear from discrimination from state machinery, regardless of your nationality, your gender, your race, or your class. In conclusion, as mentioned earlier, 
I'm still in the process of data analysis. So these were preliminary findings and I will use them to contribute towards a larger critical analysis of the data gathered from all of the 68 participants who shared their migratory experience. And I do officially want to thank them for taking all of the time to talk to me about what this process has been like. And through their stories, this project will hopefully provide an account of how this group of Guyanese women informs us about the ways the politics of belonging is negotiated within national and transnational networks and demonstrate especially how their routine yet extraordinary movement is significant in providing a narration of the complexities of intra-regional migration within the Anglophone Caribbean. So I thank you so much for listening.